Dr Peterson, good to have you on the program. Thank you very much. With the popularity of your book and your YouTube lectures, you're obviously tapping into something that nobody else is tapping into at the moment. What is that? It's, it's, partly, it's partly responsibility. I don't think that people have talked to young people about responsibility in any real sense. Not in, not, and been on their side at the same time for like 50 years. And that's just too long because most people find the meaning in their life through responsibility. Isn't it fair to say though that some people through no fault of their own have tough lives and that no matter how much person, uh, personal responsibility they take, that that won't change? So for example, yes. you and I, we've had a lot of good fortune in our lives. We've been born to uh, you know, reasonably um, affluent, peaceful countries. Mm. Um, you know, I have a, a job that I have worked hard at, but I've had lots of luck. You have mm. written a book uh, and done a series of lectures that have become embraced mm. around the world. Some people don't get lucky breaks. Like That's that. for sure. Some people just die and horribly. Yeah, life's rough. No doubt about it. And if good luck comes your way, then you should be grateful for it. And if happiness manages to manifest itself, you should be grateful for that too. But how do you give a personal responsibility message while taking account that for some people it's harder to take personal responsibility and the deck is stacked against them? Well, I think the deck is stacked against everyone to some degree because life is very difficult and we all die. So, but People, some people do have it harder than others. And, and all of us have it very hard at some times in our lives. It's like, well, what's the, what's the alternative? You take responsibility for that and try to struggle uphill because the alternative makes everything worse. It's not like it's fair. I know perfectly well that people have brutal lives. I've been a psychotherapist for 20 years. I've seen things you can't imagine, horror shows that you can't fathom and people who have been hurt in so many ways, so many dimensions. It's like, bitter? Should they be bitter? Should they be resentful? Should they become violent? These things don't help. They have to struggle uphill despite their excess burden. And it's, it's responsibility, not guilt. You know, it's not necessarily their fault. That's not the point. We've been seeing a trend um, particularly in the United States, but also here in Australia, where there has been an erosion of freedom of speech on campuses, um, where people with views that, that are considered offensive, politically incorrect or triggering um, are no longer You mean now... people with views, in other words? <laughs> uh, well, certain views, more than others, mm -hmm. tend to be not just um, the subject of protest, but those people will be, you know, there'll be attempts to exclude them from speaking at campuses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've noticed that. What is going to be the effect if that kind of uh, behaviour continues in those kinds of environments? Well, it's hard to tell. The, the broader social effect is not going to be good because lots of the things that are happening in the universities that aren't good are already leaking out into the broader social world. Um, part of what's going to happen is that people are going to stop coming and speaking on campuses. The comedians in the United States, many of them already won't speak on, they won't come and do their shows on campus because everybody's so sensitive to offence. But it, it, it'll, it also drives po political polarisation which isn't a good thing unless you want to drive political polarisation. And I think the universities are going to cut the branch off that they sit on. Is being sensitive to offence such a problem though? Like we would have previously called that manners. It's a terrible problem. So imagine, you know, imagine you, st okay, so the rule is you can't offend anyone, all right? Let's say you're speaking to one person, I can't offend you. All right, fair enough. What if I'm speaking to 10 people? Do I get to offend one in 10? How about one in 100? How about one in a thousand? You're going to come out on stage and you're going to say something important about something vital and you're not going to offend one person in a thousand? Well, you can't say anything about anything important ever without offending probably the person you're talking to. Important speech about important issues, especially contentious issues, is instantly offensive. But there are ways that you can share, I guess, um, provocative views where you attempt to still do that in a, with an air of, say, respectfulness, where you're yeah. trying to mitigate against the offensiveness. This is true, yeah. You can actually try listening when you're, when you're having a conversation, right? Assuming that both people who are having the conversation are of goodwill and they're not trying to play tricks and they're struggling towards the truth, which neither of them hold completely and both understand that, yeah, you can reach across fairly large gaps and negotiate peace. Thank God for that, or we'd be at each other's throats all the time. Well, say the example of there are some transgender people who want to not be referred to as he or she, they would prefer to be called Z or they. Mm -hmm. um, if somebody wants to be addressed like that, what does it cost me to do that? 
It's hard to tell because it, the devil's always in the details, but as far as I'm concerned, that's, that situation is, it's, it's not relevant to the issues, for example, that I was involved in. I didn't care if transgender people wanted to be called by some pronouns, like whatever, that's something for individuals to negotiate. When the, when the government makes that a compulsion and insists in their legislation that biological sex, uh, gender identity, gender expression and sexual proclivity very independently, it's like, no, they don't. That's wrong factually, and you're not going to compel my speech. I don't care what your damn justification is. So you see that as, am I right in that you see that as a curtailing of freedom? It's worse than a curtailing of freedom. It's a demand that the population uses a certain kind of linguistic approach. It's, a, it's an appropriation of speech. There's no excuse for that. That never has happened once in the history of English common law, right? It's a barrier that we do not cross. Hate speech laws are bad enough. It's not like there's no hate speech. Like anyone with any sense knows that there's hate speech. Who's gonna regulate it? Who's gonna define it? And I know the answer to that. The last people in the world you would want to. And then we, we cross another barrier and we allow the government to compel speech for some hypothetically compassionate reason? No way. That's a really bad idea. Dr. Peterson, thanks very much for joining us. Thanks a lot for the invitation.